I need a breath of fresh air. You ever say that? I need a breath of fresh air. When do you say that? When do people say that? When you're frustrated, someone said when they're stressed, when you're tired, sometimes, right, you got the yawns. If you're driving, you open up the windows, right, so you can get some fresh air. You know, we can say it in lots of different circumstances. I was thinking I probably most often hear it from people who smoke, right? And they actually kind of mean the exact opposite. <laughs> but they, it doesn't sound cool to say I need a breath of tar and nicotine, right? So they say I need a breath of fresh air. Uh, it's, it, anyway, anyway no, no real point there. Uh, but we say that, don't we? I need some fresh air. I, I need a breath of fresh air. And it means that I need to unwind or I need to clear my head or I need some new energy or, or I'm feeling kind of stale. I'm feeling kind of tired, feeling kind of drained, feeling kind of sleep or, sleepy. I need just a breath of fresh air to fill me up and re-energize me again. You know, I think that happens not just with our physical bodies, but I think that happens in relationships. Sometimes a relationship needs a breath of fresh air and things have just gotten stale. I think that can happen in marriages. I need a breath of fresh air. Something's stale here. We don't have that same energy and excitement and enthusiasm as we used to. And that's okay, but we need something new now. We need a breath of fresh air. It can happen in careers. My career just feels so done. I just need something something new, something to bring new energy to it. Um, It can happen in friendships. It can just happen in parenting. I just need some fresh air. It can happen in our faith too. Just be doing the same thing again and again and again. I just need a breath of fresh air. Go ahead and take a deep breath. It feels good to do that. Someone told me this week, we don't breathe deeply enough. We breathe just in here, but we need air to get even deeper. Try and take a deep breath, like just where it totally fills you. It's good to do that. I read this week that we can live on average about three weeks without food. Um, some of you are saying, no way. Like, I'm going to maybe not make it through the sermon. So you bring snacks, and that's great. But about three weeks, first you love. Some of you, uh, average is uh, three days without water, air, three minutes. Isn't that interesting as far as perspective? I mean, how often do you think about your breathing? I'm a little bit behind on my breathing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> We don't do that, right? I mean, but, but we think about food all the time, right? I mean, what are we going to have tonight? What are we going to have on fr- Friday night? We better start planning for that now. And yet it's so inconsequential compared to, to your breath, to your next deep breath of air. We think about water. What are we going to drink? I, I got to drink some water, but mostly I just want to drink mug root beer and, you know, makes me feel good and tingly, you know? I mean, w- but we don't think about breath a lot, and yet it's so vitally important. It's interesting to think that it doesn't matter how much air there is out there, it's totally useless if it's not in you, right? I mean, think about that. There's, I read this week, I don't know if this number is right, but 3 million, no, 300 trillion tons of air they estimate are in our atmosphere. I don't even know kind of what that means, right? It's just this huge number, but there's all this air out there, but it does you no good if it's not in here. It reminds me again of Genesis, and I just find myself going back there all the time, all the time. And uh, I think about Adam in Genesis 2 being formed, right? God talks about his shapes. We, he forms Adam out of the dust, out of the dirt of the ground. We talked about that a few weeks ago. He, he makes Adam, and then there Adam is, this lifeless pile of dirt and clay, right? There's no life in him at all, even though he's got all the freshest, purest, best air that's ever existed all around him. It's all for him, and yet there's still no life until God breathes into him. It says, God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. It wasn't until God put that air inside of him, then Adam comes to life. Then he can live and move and breathe and talk and do all these different things, but it wasn't about the air out there. It's all about the air inside of him, this fresh breath of air that God puts into him. And since Adam, all of our stories have been the same, right? I mean, one of the kid, these kids are so smart. They say, if, if you're born and you don't have any breath, then you die. Right? I mean, what's the first thing we do when a baby's born? We don't start counting the toes. Okay, we got 10 toes. Everything's good here. And then work our way to breathing. 
immediately they're checking to see, is this baby breathing? And if there's something interfering in the throat, they clean out the throat because we've got to get oxygen in there. We just have such a, a short capacity to live without air from that very first breath, and then we just keep on breathing 16 times a minute uh, on average. Just keep on, just keep on pumping those lungs 23,000 times a day. Just keep on breathing. Just keep on breathing. If you live to be 80, it's an estimated 700 million breaths. Just again and again and again. It's constant. We're going to have a little challenge right now, okay? And we're going to see who can go the longest without a breath of air. This is theological, by the way. This isn't just curiosity. Okay, so this is what we're going to do. Everyone will put up one hand, take a deep breath, and then when you're out of air, just put your hand down. We'll see who can go the longest, okay? Yeah, clear your lungs. Some of you are coughing and hacking away. Yeah. Do you need a breath of fresh air first? Just joking. Okay, hand up. Here we go. Who thinks we should get a swimming pool? Yes! Just joking. Lots of hands up still. Okay, they're starting to fall. If you're blacking out, breathe. Okay, there's like there's no prize at the end of this. There's no car or something that we're giving away. A few hands up still. It's actually a bit uncomfortable now. Four, looks like four hands. Of course, the trumpet player's hands still up. They don't breathe at all. No, it's down, it's down. Okay, a couple of hands left. I think it's over here. Oh, there's two hands left. It's a showdown now. Okay, over here. Goes, goes to the Appenheimers. Let's give a round of applause. They were breathing as a team. You know, it's interesting, I mean, we all have this different capacity, but regardless of that, we all need air just constantly, 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 and our stories are all the same as Adam. From the time he bre God breathes us to life, we just need to keep on breathing, keep on breathing, keep on breathing, but then all our stories also end the same, we'll all die, right? I mean, if you read along Adam's story, eventually it comes to this point, I'll read it to you. All together, Adam lived 930 years, and then he died. No complaining at 930, right? Like, that's pretty good. But all of our stories are going to follow that exact same line. God gives us breath, and then one day we just will stop breathing. And if you read through Kings, it'll often say that, and then he breathed his last. And then he breathed his last. And then he breathed his last. If you read George, the story of Jesus, at the end it says, and then he breathed his last breath. Right? I mean, all of us at some point are going to die. Death is just this reality in our world. Air is all about life, and then we die. It reminds me, and there's been lots of different, I think, significant reminders in our lifetimes about the reality of death, and it's a constant reality, something that happens every day. But then there's these big ones. One of those is in Cambodia. Miranda and I were there seven years ago in Cambodia, and there's this place called the Killing Fields. And they estimate that a little over one-eighth of the population was killed in the Cambodia Civil War under the Khmer Rouge. And so there's these places now you can go. There's all these mass graves. They're called the killing fields. And you can go, and it's just these places where there were these huge mass graves. And the one that we went to, there's this enormous marker. It's this huge glass box, essentially, massive, probably 30 or 40 feet tall, I'm not sure how tall, but this huge glass case filled with human bones as this reminder uh, of lots of things. But one of them it reminds me of is just death, that all of us will die. 
it's not the greatest thing to think about, is it? But it's a reality for us. As we take in this breath, we know that one day we too will breathe our last breath. And so standing there, it was such a strange phenomenon to have such a, such a huge marker, reminder of death. And at the same time, the place was so filled with life. It was strangely beautiful, but there was hundreds, maybe thousands of butterflies fluttering through these fields. And it was just this great reminder that that even in the midst of death, uh, God brings life, and there's new life there. It reminds me of Ezekiel 37. Many of you know this. We're going to read it together up on the screen. Ezekiel 37, the valley of the dry bones. So we're going to read this and pause along the way as we do that. It starts out like this. The hand of the Lord was on me. Uh, this is Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Let's go to the next screen. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Let's stop there for a second. God takes Ezekiel, this prophet, out to this valley of dry bones. Think of all the places God could take you on a field trip. This has got to be one of the worst, right? Go to this valley of death. There's all these human bones all over the place. God's pointing them out. Look at these bones. Look at these bones. More bones over here. These dry, dry bones. Think these bones can live? And Ezekiel says, I have no idea, God. Uh, you alone know. Then he tells them, start preaching to the bones. Of all the places I've had to preach, this would be the craziest, right? I mean, can you imagine that? I mean, a captivated audience, sure, but maybe uncomfortable at the same time. He starts preaching to these bones. Let's read what happens next. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Let's stop there again. I mean, can you just imagine this? If you're there, you're Ezekiel, you start preaching to this just valley of death, and then... The, I mean, this is like straight out of a horror movie, right? I mean, this is the freakiest Sunday ever in church. There's this rattling noise. It's like the ground is shaking. These bones are twitching. Then, boom, they start coming together it's like a puzzle in front of your eyes. All these bodies being rebuilt, remade. Then, as if that wasn't crazy and creepy enough, then flesh starts appearing. Muscles, tendons, ligaments, cartilage, all of that stuff. Skin, wrapping it all together. Isn't that crazy? I mean, can you imagine that? But there's, no, some of you say, absolutely not. I cannot imagine that. But they're still dead. There's still no life in them. It goes on. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, breath, from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live so I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Isn't it interesting? At the end, it all comes back to the breath. It all comes back to the breath of God filling them up again. We're going to go one more slide and just look at this order again. This is the order. Preach to the bones. Prophesy to them, right? This pile of bones. Prophesy. I'll make breath enter you, and then you'll live. Right? Do you see that order? Preach to them. I'll fill them with breath. And then they'll come alive. Later on in this uh, account, God tells him that he's talking about Israel. That Israel is just devastated. That they're hopeless. That they're lifeless. They've been taken over by Babylon. Uh, Jerusalem's been overthrown. The temple has been destroyed. And these people feel like there's no hope left. There's nothing left for them. They've been destroyed and decimated. And God says, just like you thought these bones were dead and hopeless, and you think that your situation is dead and hopeless, I'm going to bring life there. Preach the word 
to those people. I'm going to breathe new life into them, a breath of fresh air, and bring them back to life. I think for some of you, you're waiting for God also to bring a breath of fresh air, a breath of new life into some situation in your life. Uh, we talked about it before. Maybe it's your career or a relationship or your marriage or your parenting or, or a friendship that's just gone astray, whatever it is. I think we can hear God saying to us this morning, I want to breathe new life into that. I don't know how, how terrible it looks. I don't know how awful CEF looks to you or whatever the situation might be, but, but I'm the God of life. I want to breathe new life into this situation for you. There's two different words used in the Bible for breath. Uh, one of them we often talk about or we've talked about before is pneuma in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, in Hebrew, they use this word ruach. Ruach means the breath of God. And so to Adam, uh, God breathed the ruach into him, into these, these bones. He breathes the ruach into them. And again and again, it talks about the ruach of God. And that word, why don't you say that with me, ruach. Let's say it one more time all together. Ruach, the Ruach of God. That Ruach is the breath, but it's also, I mean, this is so fascinating. I think in the Old Testament and the New, it's breath and it's wind and it's the Spirit, the Spirit of God. If you look back at all those events where it talks about God breathing on them or breathing into them, you could also read, put his Spirit into them. He, he breathed his Spirit into them. In, into Adam, he breathed his Spirit. Into these bones, he brings his Spirit and fills them up. It's not, not just air. This God talks about his, his breath. He's talking about his spirit at the same time. That he breathes himself into these people. When it looked like there was no life left, no ruach, no breath, God brings his spirit and brings life again. There's this thing called sin. You all know about it. You've all heard about it. Sin just always promises more and more life. I don't know if you've thought about it that way, but just a better and better life, more and more life. And what it always delivers is more and more death and more and more devastation and more and more disappointment. And the strange thing is in our culture and in our, just around the world often, people have believed that lie and so they look to death and think it looks like life. I'm sure many of you watched or read this week that the Supreme Court of Canada has approved assisted suicide. And people are celebrating, this is so great, this is exactly what we need. And it seems so strange because why aren't we trying harder and harder for life? You know, I think about abortion too. People celebrate that and fight for that right to say, we need to be able to abort babies at any point. And in some countries we're talking about what about after birth? How long until we can make that decision if this person should live or not? I mean, why aren't we fighting more and more for life? Why aren't we rallying more and more and saying, how can we help these people live their best? And, and maybe there's a case. Maybe there's an extreme situation. Maybe there's an exception. But overall, I mean, shouldn't we just be rallying and supporting life more and more? And there's just so many examples in our world where we'd look at things and say, this is what we need. This is what freedom looks like. And and I think if we looked at Jesus as Lord and started there, we'd see, I don't, I don't know, that's, that's not really bringing us life. You know, that we have the freedom to, I can say whatever I want to anyone I want to not worry about it. I don't know if that's bringing me more and more life. Or, or I have the freedom, I can look on my phone and look at any image I want to anywhere in the world. I don't know if that's bringing more life into us. I can do anything I want. I don't know if that's helping us. I think what we need are for more and more people to be filled with the ruach, the breath of God, to fill them up with, with new life, eternal life. And we need people who are filled up with that same spirit to go and be Supreme Court judges and be lawyers and be teachers and be doctors and just keep saying, listen, God's given us life. Let, let's work with that. Let's start from there that this is a gift. We want everyone to live and have, have great lives and supply for people in their needs as they go through this life that God has given to them. It would take a lot of courage to do that, wouldn't it, in our world now? I think it's just harder and harder to stand up now and say, you know, I'm, a, I'm not in favor of that. Take a real spirit of boldness, I think, which is exactly what God has promised that he's given to us. 
I want to share a verse with you from 2 Timothy 1. It says this, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. Have you ever thought, I can't stand up and talk about against that? Well, you, you can, because God's given you that spirit, that ruach, that breath to speak boldly. You know, there's this time where Peter was preaching after Jesus had uh, died and risen again and then ascended. Peter's preaching, and he, he's mostly preaching to Jewish people, right? Because those were the people of God. And so he's telling them, listen, this Jesus you crucified, he, he's risen again, and he's the Savior. Well, this time he's at this family's house. Cornelius is his name, and he's not Jewish. And so Peter didn't even want to go. He's like, well, this is it's pointless, really. I'm, this message, this Jesus is for the Jews. There's no life for the Gentiles, for the Greeks, for these people. Because they really believe that Jesus was just there to save the Jewish people and that God was really just trying to help out and save the Jewish people. But Peter eventually goes and, and he starts preaching there and it says this, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. Then Peter said, can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. They can't believe it. Can you believe God has even given himself to these people? I thought they were totally gone. I thought there was like, I mean, I thought there was no hope, no point, no life, no chance that God would be calling out to these people as well. And yet, look, he's actually filled them with his spirit as well. Might as well baptize them, teach them about tithing, right? Let's get them into the church. It's interesting. Peter just thinks there's no hope. What's the point? Yet he does it. He preaches the word, and the Holy Spirit comes and gives them breath and life. Think about the people you know where you just think, that situation is so hopeless. That person is never going to believe in Jesus. That person was hurt by the church, and they're never coming back. Uh, this situation, they're, they're just never going to believe. I love that again and again God says, let's try it. Try me. Speak the word of life to them and see if I don't send my spirit, my breath, my ruach to them and call them to faith and life. I think the same is true for all those other circumstances in our lives, in our careers, in our marriages, in our parenting, and, and all those situations where we think this is just hopeless. I think God's calling to us there too, saying, just try it. Speak words of life and truth. Let's start there with the truth that Jesus is Lord, just like past President Bugby was telling us. Let's start here, Jesus is Lord, and then see what comes out of that situation. Let's see how God sends his Holy Spirit to us to fill us up and to give us life and give us a new perspective on the whole situation. I think with the Ruach, with the Spirit of God, it's all about putting it into life, putting it into practice. You know, just like it doesn't matter how much air is out there, you need it in you, right? And where does that air go? Into your lungs, right? Does it stop there? No. I often think about breathing like I'm some pump, right? I need it in, I need to get it out, right? Like that's the whole extent of breathing, but it's not. Once I take that air in, it goes into my lungs, then it gets caught by, by the blood shooting through our lungs, right, through these blood vessels, and then, that, then it gets carried through our whole body. So I've got air right down my fingertips and air in my toes and in my knees and in my enormous biceps, right? And I mean, it's just all this air coursing through our whole bodies. It's no good. It doesn't matter how much is out there. It needs to be in us, living, moving, breathing, circulating, and it, it brings in the good and it takes out all the bad, right? Like all the air that's been spent, then it gets shot out and then we bring in more fresh air and then it shoots it back out. I mean, that's why we keep pumping constantly more good in, more bad out. You know, just like air, it's not good enough if it's out there. It's, it's true with, with your Bibles, let's say. I mean, it's great if you have a Bible, but it's no good if it's just over there. You know, if I said, where's your Bible? And you could say, oh, yeah, it's on, uh, it's on the shelf in my bed. No, it's in the living room, right? I mean, well, that's no good, right? I mean, it's great that you know where it is, but it's not good enough to have it out there. Uh, God wants us to, like, inwardly digest his word it talks about. There's even this time where he makes one of his prophets eat a scroll, right? Just symbolizing, like, take it in. Take my word into you. Same with, with God, right? I mean, with the Holy Spirit, God doesn't say, okay, you, you know there's a Holy Spirit? Good. Check. You know there's a Jesus? Good. Check. Right? It's not good enough that you know they're out there. You need them in here. The Holy Spirit living, breathing, moving through us, bringing in more good, and then shooting out the bad. And taking out all those bad things.
things from our lives, all that sin, all that despair, all that hopelessness, all that self-centeredness. Holy Spirit comes in and tries to clear all that stuff out one breath at a time. I love that imagery. Think of that next time when we celebrate communion, that we need God in us, uh, Jesus to come into us, living, breathing, uh, running through our whole bodies, and then taking out the bad and bringing in more good. The good news this morning is that God comes to bring you life. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. God is all about life. Air is all about messages of life for us in the Bible, his ruach, his pneuma, the breath, the wind, the spirit of God filling us up. Every single day, God gives you 23,000 reasons to be thankful to him. Sometimes we sing that song, 10,000 reasons. We're at least 13,000 short in that song. I mean, God gives us so many reasons to be thankful to him each and every day, breath after breath. He provides us with everything we need for this life. He also provides for us everything we need for the next. That God has taken care of everything, paid to wipe away all of our sins, paid to make us new through this ongoing transformation of His Spirit at work in us. May you be filled with His breath, this Ruach, this Holy Spirit. May He live in you and speak through you words of life and truth that call other people to have a deep breath of this fresh and living air, our Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.